ונרד. Where are the kids, Jeremy? Oh, they were, they're all around. It was a humid day, so they're all knocked out. Good evening. Hi, Sandra. Hey, Sandra. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Just waiting a couple of minutes before we start. We have both our guest speakers. Thank you, Mr. Rose, for joining us. So, hi, Rose. And Deputy Inspector Castro. Hey, good evening. How's everybody doing? Everybody's doing well. Thank you. So we'll just be starting in about, I guess, um, 6 o'clock now, maybe about 6.04, 6.05-ish. Give people some chance to get home. Your Java Minecraft because you got Hey Cindy. Hey, good to see you. Good to see you too.
Hi, Nicole, welcome. Hi, Hector. Hi, how are you? Good. Okay, Jeremy, I think we could start in the interest of time. All right, I will call roll. Um, I am go I'm gonna mute everybody right now. Committee members, when I call your name, please unmute yourself, acknowledge your name, and then mute yourself again. If you are a board member, but not a committee member, I'm gonna note your name, but I am not going to call it. Let's start with Cynthia Felix. Here. Thank you. Uh, Ramon Acevedo. Joan Body. Here. Thank you. Danielle Lai. Kin Fung. John Garcia. Hector, uh, Hector Gonzalez. Hector. I heard you just before. Perhaps you stepped away. Mm -hmm. We'll get back to you. Uh, John Johnston. Here. Thank you. I'm here. Thank I you. Thought. Thank you, Hector. Barbara Lee. Jimmy Lee. Paul Mack. Gabino Morales. Present. Thank you. Sam Sierra. President, good evening. Thank you. Roll has been called. Thank you. I would like to thank our two special guests today. Today we have with us Deputy Inspector Castro from the 72nd Precinct and Jahai Rose from the Civilian Complaint Review Board. And today we're going to have uh, Deputy Inspector Castro talk to us about some of the quality of life issues in Community Board 7 and what are some of the plans for summer safety in our um, community board. Uh, so welcome, Deputy Inspector Castro. So if you could just give us a little bit of updates. I know you've joined us for several meetings and a lot of the same things keep coming up in particularly uh, some traffic violations, some 311 violations, uh, some uh, shoplifting, things like that, um, porch thefts, you know, stealing the packages from the porches, so if you could just give us an update on some of the things that are happening with that and some of the prevention measures that we could take here in the district, that would be great. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Deputy Inspector Ernesto Castro. Uh, I just wanna go over the, first and foremost the crime for the 28 day period, uh, which ended yesterday. Um, these are the numbers we have as of right now um, for rapes or, or even three versus three. Uh, with that being said, uh, the rapes are more uh, acquaintances. Uh, they're not street uh, of any sort. Um, robberies were down 12 versus 14 or negative two, negative 14%. Felony assaults were down 18 versus 22 on uh, negative four or negative 18%. We have seen a, a spike in burglaries, 17 versus eight or nine, 112%. Grand larcenies uh, were up 62 versus 39. Uh, that's 23 or 59%. And that all encompasses any uh, larceny, which is any theft of property above $1,000. So uh, that, and also identity theft, uh, extortion, any type of extortion being done like the IRS scam, the, that number encompasses uh, all those crimes under grand larceny. Uh, and then one of the ones uh, crimes that we've seen spike in the last three weeks 
uh, which is uh, really becoming a, a, a big uh, factor in the 72nd precinct compared to the other 12 precincts in Brooklyn South is grand larceny of autos. Uh, we're up 19 versus four, 15 or 375 percent. Um, so overall, we're up in crime 131 uh, crimes versus 90 last year, 41 or 46 percent. Um, when we talk about these uh, grand larceny of autos, uh, one of the, the messages that we've been putting out and just some of the deployment that we've been uh, pretty much has been in effect in the last two weeks, we've been putting out tweets regarding uh, the Honda, Honda CRVs, Honda HRVs, Honda Accord, 2018 or, or later. So 2018 to about 2022, there seems to be a software that the thieves are using on these push button vehicles that they are able to override the key fob and actually turn on the vehicle and steal it and actually open the vehicle from, with this software. Um, it, I've, we have an auto crime unit uh, who's monitoring this, uh, these types of crimes. This is happening in, in the Bronx, in Queens. And now, like I said, in the 72nd precinct, I've seen a, a, a pickup in that type of uh, vehicle being stolen. Um, so what have we done strategically? Uh, basically, we've moved our personnel to the overnight, uh, which is uh, we have our, our patrol aspect, which works the straight midnights. So even though most of these reports are being taken uh, in, during the afternoon hours, they're really happening on the overnight hours based on video uh, and based on our knowledge. Again, speaking with the experts in auto and grand larcenies of auto, which is auto crime, uh, there seems to be a ring who's focusing on these Honda CRVs. And what they're doing is they're stealing the vehicle, they're switching out the plate, they're putting a paper plate on it, uh, and then they're dumping it uh, somewhere in the Bronx. Uh, we found one up in a parking lot uh, at 3000 Jerome Avenue, uh, which was very, very disturbing, but the person had a, a tracking system in their, in their Honda. Um, and when I communicated with my auto crime unit, um, they actually said that that is one of the, the locations that they've been looking at. Um, and it seems to be that with the increase in value on used vehicles, um, this is why we're seeing a spike in, in grand larcenies of autos. It seems to be that the, the value of a used vehicle is higher than the value of a new vehicle. Even though these vehicles, if you look at it uh, by the year, they're fairly new 2018 to 2022, but it's an easy steal for them. It's an easy theft. Um, so uh, not only does our patrol coverage uh, been enhanced to, you know, on the midnights, uh, which is 12 to 8 a.m., um, to hit uh, targeted zones in sector Adam and sector Boy and sector Charlie and sector David, I've also added our public safety teams. So they're working uh, a later tour, which is 7.30 by 04 in the morning. I have one team working and the secondary team is coming in at 10 p.m. to about six in the morning. In addition, I'm using the NCOs who are very familiar with the areas. Uh, and they've been doing, again, the, it, the last week and a half, they've been doing a 730 by 0405 in order to attack not only this, the grand larceny of autos, uh, but also we have a grand larceny, uh, like I said earlier, uh, we're spiking in grand larcenies, which also affects autos. So if they're breaking your car and they're stealing items above $1,000, or while it's credit cards within your auto, it falls under the grand larceny. And then the burglary. So we, with this enhanced deployment, we, we're targeting three specific crimes that the 7-2 is up in, which is burglaries, grand larcenies, and grand larcenies of auto. Um, we've made uh, some, uh, about two or three arrests under the burglary and grand larceny aspect. Um, but under this grand larceny of auto, we've only had one arrest, which is uh, an individual who lives in, in the precinct. Um, and he actually uh, did not steal a Honda, but he stole a, a Ford F-150. And we were able to apprehend him based on the fact that the complainant victim called us immediately. Um, and just to give you some uh, perspective on these three crimes, the, the reason it is so hard to apprehend perpetrators of these three crimes is because they usually happen on the overnight. And most people, when we look at burglaries, most of our burglaries are happening commercially. Um, they're not in the business. They come in the next morning and they realize that 
hey, uh, we've been burglarized, right? Uh, the grand larceny of autos. So items kept in the car, you usually park your car, you go home, and the next morning you move your car. Therefore, you're realizing that your car has been broken into um, and that the items have been stolen. So, and then we look at the grand larceny of autos. Again, it's happening on the overnight while people are sleeping. When they, when they realize their vehicle is stolen, it's about five, six, maybe seven hours later. Uh, which makes it very hard and may, and and the investigative aspect jumps in where now uh, the detective uh, squad in the 7-2 has to go out and attempt to retrieve the best video possible to try to identify perpetrators. And we're having issues with that because we're not getting good video uh, regarding these three crimes that are uh, prevalent in the 7-2 precinct. So it's, it, it's it's an issue, but we're getting video, but it's not the best quality. Um, so with that said, uh, even though I've enhanced my deployment, uh, adding additional police officers and creating zones, what I'm asking from the community is a, if you own a Honda CRV, um, put additional, um, anti-theft devices on it. I know back in, you know, back in the early nineties and, and 2000s, there was the club or, or some type of other mechanism they used, uh, to prevent the steering of the vehicle or the shifting of the vehicle. If you own a vehicle of that, of that make, Honda 2018, push by into 2022, just look to add an additional uh, enhanced anti-theft device. Uh, also, if you can, uh, if they offer it, uh, the dealership, or if you want to do it yourself, um, add a GPS system in it. It helps us out a lot um, because we're able to track the vehicle and if we, if the vehicle is left in a location where we think we have a probability of capturing the, the perpetrators, what we'll do is we'll sit on the vehicle for whatever amount of time uh, and we'll attempt to make an apprehension of the perpetrators. Uh, but I am in, in contact with, again, grand uh, the auto crime unit. We have a grand larceny division, which I'm also in contact with. Um, and pretty much the message is the same. In addition, for those of you who, who are out at night, if you see something suspicious, call it in. If it doesn't look right, if you see anybody tampering with vehicles or what we call surfing, uh, surfing is basically walking up and down the block, hitting the door handles, right? Um, if you see someone doing that, hey, just call 911, say, hey, there's a suspicious male, female, give us a description. I, I saw them you know, tampering with the, with the vehicles or looking inside vehicles, that helps us out. Um, because if we can get there and, and we identify that this person is about to commit a crime or has committed a crime uh, or is in, the, is in the progress of committing a crime, we can make an arrest based on that uh, and that good information. Um, so with that said, we look at the overall, all, overall arrest for the 28 day period um, for Overall arrest, we've made 168 arrests versus 171 last year. So we're down about a percent, uh, a percent. And then on these seven major crimes, we're, we've made 32 aver arrests versus 31, which is one or 3% uh, increase on that. Um, I can go right into, does anyone have any questions regarding uh, the crimes we have, my deployment, um, what I'm asking the community, this is, this is all encompassing. We have to work together. Um, and, you know, if you see someone attempting to go into a building, again, call 911. Let us get there and let us do an investigation. Uh, we apprehended an individual a uh, couple of weeks ago based on uh, information given to us uh, that he was breaking into mailboxes. We were able to apprehend him. Um, we were able to identify the car. We took the car from him. This is a well-known car in the neighborhood. It was a BMW uh, with, with specific plates. Um, and we were, he had five, they're called Arrow U.S. Postal Service keys. He had five of them in his pocket that he was using to open up the mailboxes. And that, when they do that type of burglary, what they basically do is they take that information, those, that, those letters, and they actually barter them at, uh, uh, gambling prone locations, drug prone locations for drugs or gambling credits. Those people are taking that information and now doing identity theft with falls under the grand larceny window. And they're able to open up credit card accounts 
uh, cloned accounts and steal money from people's accounts uh, very easily. It's, it's, it's a big market. We've been in, uh, in communication with the United States Postal Service. They're doing an internal investigation. They do their own investigations. We handle it from the financial crime task force aspect. Um, but it's a very it's a very hard crime to solve because it can ha- it can happen from any place in the world. It doesn't necessarily have if they're stealing a credit card from New York doesn't mean that that person is from New York. They can be in another country across across the states and they could still uh, do that identity theft aspect of it. So does anybody have any questions uh, if you have any um ideas that that can help us again it's it's public safety is everyone's uh, responsibility if there's something that i'm missing that i'm not seeing uh please feel free to uh, share that information with us i do see a, a couple of hands up but before i i get to the people with their hands up i have one quick uh question and comment do you have palm cards or brochures that we could share with the community board as a mailing letting them know what are some of the things like you said with the honda crvs how to protect your car and how to protect that. I know with mail theft, it's kind of hard, right? Because the mailman comes, puts it in your mailbox and you expect to see your mail. Um, But anything that you could uh, provide to us that we could give out to the community as part of our follow-up report. And, you know, if you have it in different languages, that would be great because I do know that a lot of the fraud is happening with our immigrant community that may be scared to report it. I know a neighbor of mine, they got their social security card was stolen for their child that came in the mail and I urged her to report it. And she was a little afraid because um, she's not documented. And I said, oh no, don't be afraid. You could report it and she did. But maybe if I have anything like that, that we could share with the community in the different languages, that would be very helpful so that they know what to do if they, you know, they're expecting an important piece of mail. And it's unfortunate. And Jeremy, I don't know how we could push this, my niece, has a service, but it's not here yet where you could actually sign up and the post office tells you what mail you're supposed to be getting so that you, if you don't get it, um, you could actually call the post office. Um, but it's not in, it's not in 11220 yet. Cause I tried to sign up for it and it's not available. If it's for yes. profit, we cannot promote it. No, no, it's not for profit. It's part of the United States postal service. Gotcha. It's a service that the post office does it's uh, called advanced mail. They email you a copy of the front of the letters and it's a free service. It's just, we don't have it. And she lives in Borough Park and they have it, uh, but it's free. I'll send you the link from the post office. I'm not sure how we could advocate for the post office to get that, uh, but maybe we should um, see how quickly it's coming to this neighborhood. I would suggest since it's a federal issue, issue we might want to involve our Congress people. Great. Thank you. So, Jeremy, do you want to call on folks? Or- Happy to do so. Barbara Thank Lee, you. you're first. One second. Hi, everybody. Good to talk to see you, people. Um, Cynthia, I have that service with getting the mail on your phone. I've had it for like three years now, at least, and I live in the neighborhood. So I'll, I'll let you know later how to do that. Okay, so my question to you, well, um, um, I forgot, is it Commander Don Castro? Yes, yes, that's fine. (laughs) Castro is fine, that's fine. Okay, so um, I live at 744th Avenue and I've had a problem with my building and it's mostly the the tenants of my building don't close the door properly. And so the drawer is ajar. And what happens is that people come in like there's like all these people from the homeless shelters and stuff, they hang out on the corners of 24th Street and 4th Avenue but by the um, deli that closed. And they can see, I guess, people going in and out and they can tell nobody's there. And they've come into my building, you know, a couple of times already. And they, they you know, make noise and hang out there. And um, it's just really discouraging. I'm not sure like how to deal with that. So first and foremost, I would tell you, uh, get in contact with your landlord. Uh, that door is supposed to have a mechanism where it actually closes behind right. any tenant that leaves the building. And then the actual, those actual individuals going into your building without a business, in other words, not visiting anyone or right. not doing any type of business, call 911, that is trespassing. So, uh, all so we I, need is, all I, we need is, 
I'm sorry. All we need is a complainant victim. So if you're calling, you have to you have to be the complainant victim to us, letting us know, hey, these individuals have no business in my building, and I want to press charges, and we're able to arrest the individuals who are trespassing on the property. I understand that, but um, I called the first time when they were hanging out and making noise and stuff, and um, I called the precinct the next day for a follow up, and they said that they didn't get my call. But when I came to the sub, to your community council meeting, um, my NCO acknowledged that my call did come in. So I was just kind of wondering, like, what happened there. Uh, I'll look into that. Um, we have uh, processes in place to to check to see why calls are not being answered. Every nine one one call is tracked. Every one every nine one one call is recorded, as well as three one one calls. So if there is an issue, we can do an internal investigation and see if uh, the officers went there, what time they went there, um, and what was the final disposition on that job that they had on that particular day. So uh, we'll look into it. But uh, again, first things first is, is let your landlord know, hey, no, the door's staying open. So yeah, so we can make sure that, and if they need help, uh, we have a crime prevention officer at the precinct. His name is Officer Chiamella. Mm -hmm. He'll go out and do a survey of your building and he'll let you know, give you advice on how we can make the building safer oh, um, thank you. and give that advice. And, and, you know, we do an entire uh, write up showing what areas are vulnerable in that building or in any building What's uh, just to help uh, <laughs> officer, police officer Chiamella. Okay. Thank you so much. You're welcome. I have Cynthia Gonzalez next. Yes, hello, good evening, everyone. Um, and thank you for coming to answer our questions. Um, I would like to hear more about the robberies and burglaries and what's being done about that. So as I stated earlier, the, the burglaries, what are we doing with the burglaries? We've, we've done some redeployment of our personnel. Uh, which is basically we've created zones, areas where we're, we're seeing the most uh, clusters of burglaries and robberies. It happens to be that sector Charlie and David. Uh, and now we've seen an emergence in, in sector Adam where uh, we've seen some areas where, you know, they, they're starting to peak uh, or they have peaked and we have deployed our personnel in that area. Again, the most important part of it and, and it is the community's uh, intervention when they see something that doesn't look right, or they're aware of a crime being committed, that they call 911 and they, you know, let us know, hey, you know, on 50th Street and 4th Avenue, I see a guy with a chainsaw breaking a, a bike lock, or there's individuals going into a building, in and out of the building, they don't look like they're from the neighborhood or whatever. That'll allow us to get to that, to that building or that area much quicker. I have no hot water. Did you put your stove on? It's nothing. Hello. Excuse, Hello. Excuse me. Could you please tell us what these uh, A, B, C, D, what areas are those? So a sector, sector Adam is Windsor Terrace. Uh, it covers from 26, 25th Street uh, down to Prospect Park Southwest, all the way to Ocean Parkway in the area of Ocean Parkway. So that's sector Adam. Uh, up to about Third Avenue. Um, Sector Charlie runs from about 55th Street down to 39th Street, covers uh, the east side of Third Avenue across to 6th Avenue, uh, and then on the west side of 7th, and then Sector David uh, covers the higher numbers on the 50s, 56th Street to 62nd, uh, depending on the peak, because on towards 3rd Avenue, the peak is 62nd Street. Towards uh, 5th Avenue, the peak is 65th Street, over to 8th Avenue. Uh, so Sector David runs from 1st Avenue to 8th Avenue. And, um, and that's Sector David. And then Sector Boy is Industry City. So the command, the 72 precinct, is broken into four sectors. Adam, Boy, Charlie, David. Those are the acronyms we use. Uh, to identify the areas in the sectors. Thank you. You're welcome. 
And I put a link in the chat if anyone's interested. You put your address and it actually tells you the sector you belong to. And if you go on newyorkcity.gov slash NYPD 72nd Precinct, you can actually see how each sector is sectorized so that you have a better understanding of, you know, the way the streets are, are divided. I have Sam Sierra next. Hi, good evening, and thanks for taking that uh, time to share with us. We really appreciate this. Um, I, my concern is related to an area, uh, I'm 58th Street and 4th Avenue. Uh, a particular part of that block is, one could say, drug, drug infested with drug related activities. I should not have to walk by that block with my eight year old granddaughter and have her tell me, hey, Papa, look, this is this and this on this block. Um, I, I understand that we don't have the we type of resources where, where we can have someone standing on that corner 24 seven, I understand that. Um, but we could really use some kind of help uh, with that. Uh, the, the business is conducted uh, as though with no impunity. I understand it would take someone to call and it's, uh, those are different sets of challenges. I understand that. But all these occurrences occur with just a regularity, like it's okay. And, and I'd like to see some type of a, uh, a disruption in, their, in that regular, the, you know, them performing their routines regularly as they do. Whether it's in nope. the form of, uh, and I think we may have had this, uh, uh, spoke about this a while back. Uh, I know there are some areas where they have uh, certain types of crimes where they uh, put the spotlights up perhaps at night and, and or, or when they put the, that trailer out uh, by the area, um, but we, we could really use some help uh, with that area. And also understand that there's a school a block over. So I, I don't know if you're aware, but I just wanted to make you aware of that situation. I, and I also know that it's one of many, but I, I really needed to, to just share that uh, regarding 58th Street and just the close proximity to the school. And I yield so, my Thank you. I, absolutely. I'm well aware of 58th Street, 3rd to 4th. We have been doing some work there. It may not be prevalent as far as what you're seeing. Um, but we have done some work in that area. Last week, we, we arrested an individual who was actually doing what you're saying he was doing. Um, it, it, when it comes to that process, it's a very slow process. Uh, even though you're seeing it, it's, it's a little bit easier than us because when we show up, what do we have on? Our uniforms. We have a, a blue and white vehicle. Uh, but we are well aware that is one of my problematic locations, identified as a problematic location. Um, and, you know, we, we continue to monitor it and it's, it's kind of sort of a, a work in progress when it comes to that type of crime, because they're well-versed in, in, in how to do it. So, uh, be, you can rest assured that we are, we are working, uh, with our different units. Uh, and I'm well aware of 58th street third to fourth. Great. Thank you so very much. Thank you. I have Joan body next. Um, again, I want to thank you um, for coming. And my question to, to you is, where in Windsor Terrace specifically are these burglaries occurring? So most of our burglaries that we're seeing, they're happening, happening on Fifth Avenue in the 20s. Uh, we've seen a little spike uh, on Fifth Avenue in, in between 21st Street, 23rd, also Prospect Park Southwest area. Um, we've seen some, a couple of uh, burglaries. Officer uh, Ma uh, Detective McGrath has been very in tune with 81 Ocean Parkway is one of our buildings that is, is prevalent for that, for, for the burglaries in that area. Uh, uh, 35 Mac McDonald, we've, take, we've taken a burglary there. Again, the, the, the hardest issue with the burglaries is that um, we're not getting called regarding the burglary when it's happening. Of course, again, and, and just to give you a little perspective on the burglaries, when I speak about burglaries, um, most of our burglaries, and I would say about 99% of them, are either commercial, residential lobby. So they're not burglaries inside apartments. 
so they're not entering apartment buildings that are occupied in the sense of apartments themselves. They, they're actually breaking in or either buzz, being buzzed in or being let in or, or jigging, you know, uh, putting some type of object in between the lock and the door, opening up and then stealing packages from the lobby area or any other items left outside the doors of the residents of those buildings. That's what we're seeing. And then the commercial aspect, uh, a lot of our commercial burglaries are happening further up in, in Sector Boy, which is Fourth Avenue, which is close proximity to Sector Adams. Um, and, and they're just taking the cash register, you know, forceful entry. So these burglaries that we, when I talk about burglaries, they are not uh, in the sense of inside someone's resident while they're sleeping. Uh, copper piping is another uh, uh, burglary. They're stealing them from construction sites. They're stealing the copper piping because it's very valuable and they're selling it. We've done uh, a couple of operations uh, regarding that. And we, we've also been in contact with some of our specialized units regarding the copper pipe. So it's a work in progress. I would say that uh, one advice I would give is don't allow anyone in. If they're pressing your, bu your buzzer and they're not there to serve you specifically, do not let them in the building. Um, you know, posting signs in the building, letting the other tenants know to not allow anyone in. If they're there to see someone, that person should be able to give them access to the, to the apartment building. Um, and, and that's critical. And if you see anyone, again, this is the suspicious people within your area that you believe are, are trying to get into your building, just call 911. We'll, we'll go over and we'll investigate. And if it's determined that they are uh, trying to commit a crime, then we will take the legal action necessary. Uh, thank you. I, I'm on Southwest and I have eight buildings here. I'm the president of the condo. And I, okay. I, I do have the notes in the door, uh, in, in the halls, telling people, please don't buzz anybody in unless you ask and you know who, is, who they are. Um, yep. But, you know, it is what it is. But, and, and, and again, <laughs> if, if you would like us to come out and look at these buildings, Officer Chiamella, uh, we'll do a, a, a burglary prevention survey and, and tell you what the vulnerabilities of each building is and give you suggestions. It's up to you if you want to put anything yes. in place. Okay. Yes. Anytime. Yes. Absolutely. That would be wonderful. We do have cameras, by the way. Excellent. Excellent. I have Gabino Morales next. Hi. Good afternoon, Deputy Inspector Castro. Thank you Good for afternoon. coming on. Absolutely. I appreciate you coming on, and I appreciate your precinct doing all the work they do in our community. Um, I did want to ask you a question on in regards to um, if there is a community member who wants to make a, a complaint on an officer, uh, what is that process like, and how how long does that process take? Um, I only asked this because I did have an incident where me, myself, I had to have a complaint on an officer and it took me about six hours of, of trying and six hours of distraught feelings and there's video recordings inside the precinct and I was just uh, emotionally um, scarred uh, with that situation. And if this happens to me, I was just wondering how can we have trust in police officers if we have community members who doesn't don't speak the language uh, English, um, how can they get a complaint on an officer, um, and what is that process like? So the I, I would have to say I know we have CCRB on, so um, if you need additional information, but we have a very uh, good process in place. Uh, which first and foremost, if you had that incident, and um, you can ask for a supervisor at at the precinct. They must take your complaint. They must. That, that is not an option. So that's the first part. So if you, if you did have an, an issue at the precinct uh, and you were present at the precinct, they have to take the complaint. Um, and then that, that complaint would go through the process. So depending on, you know, the length of the complaint is the amount of time that you would be in the precinct uh, because we do give you a, a sheet, a CCRB sheet, 
uh, that you would definitely uh, fill out in your own words what transpired, time, place, if you have the officer's names. And then we would take that and transpose it uh, and we would log it into our system. Uh, and then it would take the process of the investigation. This, the second part is uh, you can go directly to CCRB. Uh, I'm gonna off the top of my head, I, I believe it's 100 Church Street. Um, you can file a complaint there. And then also um, you can file a complaint uh, over newyorkcity.gov. Um, but if there's any other information, it shouldn't take that long. It just depends on how long your, your, you know, the complaint is. Like if it's something that, hey, you know, they disrespected me verbally and you write that down on the sheet, we should be able to just type it up immediately, get a log number. We use log numbers to track uh, our complaints. Um, and then give you give you the the log number that we've we've taken, and then that investigation would take its course. Uh, if it went to CCRB, goes to CCRB. Uh, if it if it has to be diverted to Internal Affairs Bureau, it would go to the Internal Affairs Bureau, um, and then get investigated in that process. Uh, in any case, um, if at the precinct level you you went and they were not uh, more than courteous and professional with you. That is why I'm here. Uh, you can come and see me, you ask for me. I wanna see Deputy Inspector Castro. Uh, you know, I came here and I need to speak to him personally. You would come to me and then I would ensure that that process go, gets in, you know, that complaint gets logged in and that the process uh, begins and moves forward. Um, but if CCRB can jump in and, and if there's any other information that they can supply, but I, I would welcome you to, you know, to come down to the precinct if you feel comfortable. If not, use the other two outlets. We would definitely take your complaint and we would move forward with that complaint. And whatever the investigative time is, it, it just depends on, you know, on the communication as far as with you. Um, we do have translator lines and we do have certified translators in the precinct. So if you speak uh, Spanish, right? Um, we have the translator line that we use and we also have officers who are certified. If you speak any type of uh, Asian dialect, Mandarin, we have officers uh, that speak that, we have greeters that speak that language. So that should never be a problem uh, as far as translating the information. And you can actually write, if, uh, if your primary language is, is another language other than English, you can just write the, the complaint in your own language and then it'll become our responsibility to ensure that that information is translated uh, into the English language, it is our responsibility, and we will make sure that it's translated by a certified translator of the department uh, and move forward. Thank you, Deputy Inspector Castro. I do appreciate those words. And Absolutely. God bless the 72nd Precinct. We want to have that unity between community members and police officers. I appreciate Absolutely. it. Thank you, Gambino. Thank you. And Jahai Rose is going to give a little bit more on the process because like uh, Deputy Inspector Castro has always said at each of our meetings, if there's any issue that's not taken care of, at one of the meetings there were parent, uh, some um, community members saying 311 calls weren't answered. He's always made himself available to support because he has said repeatedly that he's there to ensure that himself and his officers are held accountable for things in the community. So I wanna thank you for your transparency, uh, Deputy Inspector Castro. Um, there is a question in the chat that I'm going to just bring up. And, and Cynthia, I know- there also, There's also at least one attendee with a hand up as well. Perfect. So in the chat, uh, and this is simple, uh, how can people sign up for the precinct to get the email announcements for the community council meetings and for the sector meetings? And I know Tina is an attendee uh, she's on the line and she is the president of the community council. So I don't know if Tina, if you would like to speak, uh, she's on, uh, we could unmute you if you would just like to share, how could people join the meetings, the meetings and when they take place. And Tina has done a great job of spreading the meetings out throughout the community. So they're in different parts of the community. Tina. Can we unmute Tina, Jeremy? I, I gave her the ability to unmute herself. Okay, Tina. Thank you so much guys for having me. Thank you. Yes, um, we, you could sign up. My email address is tinaponte76. I also put it in the, in the chat. 
Um, I also do texting, so I'll put my cell phone number in the chat. I like to send out text messages and emails for my council meetings and also for our NCO meetings. So I also have it for our NCOs. So I get all the NCOs information and I spread the word. So please feel free. I'm going to put all my information in the chat, reach out to me, you know, call me, text me, email me, and I will definitely put you on our list. Thank you. And, and, it, the and there's no meetings for the summer, just in case. No meetings wondering. for the summer, no meetings, but we are having national night out. So that's a big one, August 2nd from four to eight. So please everybody come to Sunset Park. It's gonna be nice. And um, our next meeting will be September 13th in Windsor Terrace in Sector Adam. And I'll also put that information in the chat. Thank you, Tina. W and I'd, I'd, also, I'd also invite everyone to join our Twitter account, which we post every crime prevention flyer on it. We post relevant information that's going on uh, in the community, events that, we, that we've participated in, and also our meeting events. Uh, please feel free. And we also have a Facebook account that you, you can join and uh, get information off the Facebook account. Terrific. Uh, Jeremy, you said there were some a couple of hands yeah. up. And I, I, have, I have uh, Araceli Gomez. Araceli, you can unmute yourself. Hi, can everyone hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Um, this is my first meeting, so this is super informational, super interesting, super important. Um, I wanted to comment about the car thefts. Um, I did want to ask, are air tags helpful for the 72 precinct in order to track? Because I know a couple of my friends who do Ubers uh, throw some air tags in their cars just in case. So uh, it, I would tell you that anything, uh, especially any tracking device is helpful. Um, I can't sponsor one or the other, but any tracking device that you can use on your vehicle uh, whether it's the company or whether it's this Apple tag or any other tag uh, that affords you that GPS, it is, it is imperative for us to capture the individual and recover your car as quickly as possible. I'll give a story very quickly. About a year and a half ago, uh, there was an individual, his, his Maserati, if I'm not mistaken, it was a Maserati was stolen with his priceless dog in it. Um, we immediately brought him back to the precinct. Uh, we were doing the paperwork and I happened to be there. And I said, sir, you have a tracking device on the vehicle? He's like, you know what? I have a service through Maserati, but I haven't activated it. It's going to cost me 350. I said, it would help us if we had that. Uh, and remember your dog is in the vehicle. He immediately paid for that service. And we were able to apprehend the individual in the 10th precinct, recover the dog, which was priceless to him. Uh, and it was a very big success story. Within an hour and a half, that individual went from Brooklyn into Manhattan, uh, into the 10th precinct on, four, I believe it was 41st Street between 8th and 9th. And uh, we actually sent the 10th precinct over there because we collaborated. And we were able to apprehend him, get the, do the dog back and the vehicle. And he was very happy. So, yes, any type of GPS device is, is something that would definitely help us out because when a crime is committed, we take it seriously and we want to try to make the apprehension as quickly as possible um, to bring people to justice. Got it. Thank you. Thank you. I have Cynthia Gonzalez next. Sorry, I was unmuting. Um, I have actually two questions for you. Uh, one, one statement and one question for you. Um, 53rd Street train station has um, two entrances. They're both entrance and egress, but the one on the 52nd Street side, that um, exit, I'm going to say exit because I never really use it as an entrance, but that exit has been um, known for being a shooting gallery. Number one, there's always, um, you know, a needle paraphernalia on that station. And it's the outside of that station um, is known to be sort of like a haven for 
uh, people that are on drugs. I'm, I don't know that these people are committing crimes other than shooting up. They're just there. And, um, you know, it's also an entrance that allows people to evade, like, they're like fair beaters. They stick around and wait for the train to come. And when people are exiting, uh, people are entering through that exit without paying. Um, so that spot there, that particular, um, I'm going to call it an exit, but it's also an entrance. Um, that particular area is right adjacent to the new public library that's going to be opening up relatively soon. And there's going to be a lot more child traffic in that area uh, when that occurs. And so I want to know if you are aware of that particular problem in, in that particular location. And the second question that I have for you is, um, you know, I recently learned that in Manhattan, they are doing these sweeps of these illegal e-bikes that are happening which we have a lot of that going on here in Sunset Park. And we would like to know if our neighborhood is going to have access to that service of, of recovering those illegal vehicles, because we have a lot of people, um, we have a lot of problem with the e-bike system where people, there's no way of tracking them when they mow you down on the street. Um, there's people that they don't, they don't follow the law. There's no helmets, there's no safety protection for these people. And they just run through the streets, run through the sidewalks. It's just like untenable. Uh, we have a lot of that activity and could we possibly be the beneficiaries of that system that collects these illegal, uh, you know, uh, vehicles because, I understand that in the city, what they're doing is once they um, once they identify them, they cut the chains and they take them away. Um, so those are my two questions. All right. So the first one with the, with the uh, transit system, fifty second right. and fourth. Right. Um, that that's actually uh, overseen. That transit hub is overseen by Transit District uh, Thirty Four, which is Captain Chung. So I'm gonna have uh, I'm gonna reach out to him uh, as far as the top side. What we would call the top side is the street. Uh, I will have my NCOs go over there and uh, monitor the situation in that location to see if what you know if what you're stating is actually occurring. But also understand that um, they have rights also. So loitering is not a crime uh, in the sense of if they're just standing there. Uh, they have to be doing something illegal. We can't just tell people to move. We can't just tell people, you know, to get off the block just because. So if we see something illegal, aggressive panhandling, right? If they're jumping the turnstiles, uh, the transit system will make the arrest on jumping uh, the turnstiles or fare evading. Uh, so I will have a discussion with uh, Captain Chung from uh, Transit District um, uh, to see if he could put some personnel there to give some, some attention to that 52nd Street and 4th Avenue. Uh, egress. Um, and I will also have my NCOs and my NCO sergeant go over to that location and, and give me give me some feedback as to what they're seeing. Um, and, and hopefully our presence will be a deterrent, just our presence being there. But definitely, if there's any crime being committed, we will take action. Uh, number two on the e-bikes. All right, the e-bikes, um, I concur with you. I've seen e-bikes out there. They, you know, we've, we've done e-bike operations. Brooklyn South is big on it. Uh, we just can't take e-bikes just because we want to. There has to be a violation. There has to be something more than just they're chained up to a, you know, to a bike rack or they're chained up to a pole. There has to be a little bit more. We just can't take people's property just because it becomes a legal issue. Um, if they are, the on city the is doing it. The city is doing well, it. I, again, Currently, they're I, just not doing it here. No, no. Again, we'll, we'll, I'm going to, I used to work in Manhattan South. I'll see what type of uh, uh, illegal e-bikes they're taking off the streets. Because again, I, I have to make sure that we can implement that uh, fully and how are we going to implement it as far as the 72nd precinct on Brooklyn South. But I will definitely reach out to Manhattan South, uh, which, which is actually, I, I believe who you're speaking about uh, in Manhattan. 
um, because I did work there and, and we did do some, some good uh, e-bike uh, operations. Um, but f- first and foremost, um, as far as e-bikes, I know we had a discussion in our last community council meeting uh, where we're starting to see uh, mothers with children on e-bikes. We're trying to get them helmets. We're going to be doing some outreach with that. Uh, we do issue summonses for e- illegal e-bike uh, usage. Um, we look for what we would call the, the VTL, the vehicle uh, traffic law violation. Uh, and if they're eating red lights or they're on the sidewalk, um, we will address it. It's, it's, there's a lot of e-bikes, a lot. I see it each and every day. I, I'm not going to lie to you if I tell you that when I step out of the, the precinct, we have a, a, a bike lane. I have to look three or four times before I cross. Uh, and, and it's, it's a, as far as the, the, the speed at which they're going, it's a little bit harder. We don't have a mechanism like a, a regular vehicle to track the speed of those, of those e-bikes. I know they can go up to 35 miles an hour. Um, and it's something that, I, that we continue to work on. Uh, my, my executive officer, uh, Captain Sang, uh, actually puts out operations for e-bikes. But I'll look into what um, Manhattan's doing. As far how as uh, is the, how, how is the precinct identifying illegal bikes? I mean, how how do, how do what is the process like? You know, if a person is riding a bike, you know, that's one thing. You know, you're riding it, but how do you identify those that are not legal? Well, I, I this this is what I'm trying to get to. Unless they commit an infraction. Uh, of some sort, uh, a, vi- a vehicle uh, traffic law infraction or a criminal court infraction, which is driving recklessly. Uh, there is no such thing as illegal illegal e-bikes. They're all legal. It's it's the fact that if they're operating in an, in an illegal manner, that's what makes them illegal. If but you're clearly, operating in- clearly that's not a fact because in the city, they are cutting chains of bikes that are chained Again, up so clearly I, nobody I did to, anything illegal they just taking the bikes I, and bringing them to a place that's crushing them i have to look into that because the only the only uh part that i've seen of, of is motorcycles dirt bikes automatically are illegal and quads are automatically illegal on the streets so yes if we see a dirt bike uh chained up to a pole we that is automatic if we see a quad an atv chained up to a pole or just uh, just sitting on, on a street uh, corner or street road, that is 100% illegal. But I will get back to you and I will get back to Cynthia because I have to look at this. You're asking me a question that I'm telling you I got to look. I got to do a little research, okay, because everything is a legal issue. All but right? can you, address, Manhattan, can you Manhattan, address the precinct's capacity to do this because clearly in Manhattan they have the capacity if we don't have the capacity to do that then that indicates like a flaw in in what we can do well I'm not um, I'm, again I have to look into it I'm not saying we don't have the capacity I have to see what type of operation because you could be telling me they're doing this this operation because visually you're seeing it but there may be other legal factors that they're using. So as far as the capacity, the NYPD has all resources cover the entire five boroughs. There's no such thing as one borough having more resources than another borough. Um, so we cover. If it's something that we can do and that would, would, there's, I have to see what type of aspect are they using when they identify these bikes as being illegally parked or being illegally chained up. All of that I have to look into, which I will. I will look into it tomorrow. And uh, again, I'll get back to you if you want to leave your number with Cynthia or you want to give me, I'll get back to you with that information. You're asking me to give you a definite now. Again, we've done enforcement. If, I, if, I, if you want to come down to the precinct, I'll show you the enforcement we do because we have confiscated e-bikes, motorcycles, quads. We have them on, on our rooftop, uh, ready to go to our property clerk's office. So it's not like we're not addressing the situation. It's that there's an abundance. Here's another thing that got me worried too, is these illegal uh, e-bike uh, locations, which we've had three fires based on these batteries, these lithium batteries, something that I'm looking into. I just had a fire, three alarm fire uh, yesterday. And we've, we've the fire marshal has, has looked into it and there was an illegal, uh, uh, bat- illegal batteries being stored in that location. So we're looking into that also. So it's a work in progress. 
again, it's not that we're not taking enforcement. It's not that we don't have um, the resources. I am going to follow up. And if, if you want, I'll follow up with you tomorrow. Thank you, Inspector. Absolutely. I have Cindy Vandenbosch next. Hi, thank you so much for joining us today. And um, I, I just have a few quick questions. Um, one is uh, something that's just come up in other, uh, uh, an ability and access and accessibility committee meeting that we had. Um, and that was a question around the accessibility of the precinct. So if there's a resident who uses a wheelchair um, or you know, has difficulty with steps, will they be able to enter the precinct and also use the bathroom once inside the precinct? Absolutely, absolutely. Our, our precinct is a, is a first level precinct. All our bathrooms are for the public and they are accessible to anyone with a disability. And there's a ramp to enter the building? There, it's actually street level. There, there's okay. no ramp necessary okay, at, at great. the 72nd precinct. Okay, great. Thank you so much. And then the other question I had goes back to the e-bikes thing, which is I'm a bicycle rider. I'm a pedestrian. I also drive, but I, um, you know, I, I'm wondering, uh, going back to this thing about not being able to monitor the speed of the, e the bikes that are being used in the bike, the e-bikes that are being used in the bike lanes. Is that correct? You can't, there's no way you can monitor the speed of a car, but you can't monitor the speed of an e-bike that's going 35 miles per hour in a bike lane. <laughs> well, we, we, we have uh, radars that actually okay. monitor the speed of vehicles. I don't have any, any type of radar that monitors the e-bikes, their speed. I've heard that they've gone up to 35 miles an hour. Again, can I confirm that every e-bike goes 35 miles an hour? I can't confirm that, um, but it's a mode of transportation that's being used. And again, whenever we see any type of reckless uh, maneuvers with it and we are able to stop it safely, because that's the main thing. We're not gonna give chase an e-bike where we're gonna jeopardize that, that person's life or anyone else in the community. Right. But whenever we can, we do stop the e-bikes. And I would have to tell you that based on uh, my information from my traffic officers, and I've also had discussions with David Strada from the bids, uh, a lot of the e-bike violators are your delivery guys that we're seeing are not obeying, you know, the way they're supposed to, they're being issued the summonses, um, but just the taking of the bike, there has to be a little bit more than just, you know, they, they, we have to see a violation being committed. And I understand, like I said, I have a, a bike lane in, immediately in front of the 72nd precinct and I'm like, oh my God. Um, but there's a, a legal issue, right? What we see and what we can prove is two different things. I can say that person's doing 35 miles an hour, but can I prove that he's doing 35 miles an hour? And that's where it becomes for us. Remember, we have to obey the law yeah, ourselves. Sure. So when we take action, it has to be, it has to be with probable cause. Yeah. And I, I would say, you know, as a bicyclist, I mean, I've been passed by people that are not just on e-bikes, but on motorcycles, like on, on the bike lanes in the district. And it's scary, you know, so um, I appreciate any enforcement you can do around just that kind of, Absolutely. it's, it's reckless a, to be going that fast in a bicycle lane. <laughs> I, I agree hundred percent. I'm, I'm also a biker. So I take a lot of uh, pride in that and being a, a responsible biker. And I, I expect everyone else to do so, but Again, what we can do is issue the summons. Uh, if we take a bike, if they go to court the next day and they get that summons, they pay it or whatever, they get a right to get their property back. We cannot hold their property uh, because, you know, it, it belongs to them. So, yeah, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Okay, we're going to take the last question from the attendees uh, and then move on to Jahai. So okay. the last two questions, uh, I see George has his hand up and then we'll move on to Jahai Rose. George, you can unmute yourself. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, Deputy Inspector, yeah, we've spoken about bike riding and all that. I personally have driven my car at 2530 and these e-bikes pass me. So they do go fast and I'm glad you point that out because if somebody comes out of their car, like on 4th Avenue, I don't know who made those bike lanes. If you park your car and you get out on the passenger side with a child, you can almost get run over by those e-bikes. But I also wanted you to bring up the build the blocks. I have found those very, very beneficial. 
I don't know if everybody that's listening is aware of these build the blocks. Maybe you can invite everybody to go to these because I've actually gone and I actually have conversations with the police officers you have there. And that's a great way to meet them. So if maybe you could talk about the build the blocks if people are not aware of it so they can go and attend because I like them. Thank you. Absolutely, George. Thank you. Thank you for the comments. Just so that everyone knows, um, the build the block meetings are basically uh, uh, cavaliered by our neighborhood coordination officers. Like I said, we have four sectors, Adam, Boy, Charlie, David. They each do their own quarterly. So every three months, they do a meeting in, in various locations. It's only the police officers and their sergeant. So I am not in, in included in this meeting. And this is so that the community brings their individual concerns regarding the individual sectors to these police officers. But in addition to that, we have the other neighborhood coordination officers uh, present at the meetings in case there's a crossover in issues. So if there's an e-bike issue on 4th Avenue, Sector Boy and Sector Charlie and Sector David cover that, that 4th Avenue corridor, they, they, would, they would all be, they would all be right. at this meeting uh, and you're I'm able talking. to speak. And you're able to speak uh, to those officers and they actually do the enforcement uh, and they would collaborate with our traffic safety officers to do any type of enforcement regarding any type of traffic violation, any type of quality of life issue. So these these meetings, one, they're, uh, they're pushed out through Twitter. We also hand out flyers um, and everyone is invited to, to attend. Um, I inquire from the officers based on the feedback that you give as to what was you know, discussed at the meetings. And if they need any additional resources to conduct any type of operations, then I would facilitate that for them. Uh, myself and my executive officer would facilitate that so that they can address the, the community concern. Thank you. And Tina just uh, sent me information on two meetings that are this week, build the block. So I will be adding them in the chat, but one is for sector B. And that will be on 25th Street at 130, 183 25th Street this Wednesday. And the next one, and I'll add it to the chat, is for Sector A. And I know someone was acting about Sector A. I think that was you, Joyce. Uh, Joy, excuse me. And that will be Thursday, June 30th at uh, 646 Fifth Avenue. But I will add the two flyers to the chat. Uh, thank you so much, Deputy Inspector Castro, thank for joining you. us. Thank You're you, welcome you. to stay. Uh, we want to thank you in the 72nd uh, for the collaboration and uh, for the information that you provided. I'll just follow up with you offline regarding some of the concerns Cynthia Gonzalez had regarding the e-bikes, as well as getting some flyers out that we could share with the community on keeping safe. And we look forward to having a safe summer here in the 72nd. Uh, once again, um, National Night Out will be August 2nd in Sunset Park, that is a night where the police officers are there. They do some community building, give out information. There's also other members from the community that are there that provide information. Uh, there's a bouncy house for the kids. There's a basketball tournament and uh, some food and some snacks that are provided by the community council. So I um, want to encourage everyone to attend and to go. Uh, so thank you again, Deputy Inspector Castro. We look forward to seeing you at our next meeting. And now, without further ado, thank you, Jahai, for being very patient. Jahai Rose has attended a lot of our meetings in person. Uh, so we welcome him via Zoom. And he's going to talk to us about what is the Civilian Complaint Review Board and what is the process um, and how is their relationship uh, in connection with any type of things that you don't feel comfortable or you feel that the police officer didn't handle it correctly, what are some of your options that you could do? Shahai, welcome. And Hello, great to see evening, you everyone. via Zoom. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for allowing me to do today's presentation. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat. There may be intermittent sections where I may ask if you have any questions. Um, so don't be shy. Um, if it's okay with the board, Feel free to unmute yourself and um, ask, and um, you all can select those that can ask those questions. I answer any questions that I can answer in this meeting. Okay, uh, is it okay for me to share my screen? Yes, I just need to make you a co-host. Give me one moment. Okay. 
and you should be able to share your screen now. Okay, perfect. <clears throat> we can see it. Perfect. <clears throat> okay, so um, what is the Civilian Complaint Review Board? Uh, the CCRB is a city agency. Uh, we're separate from the New York City Police Department. Our responsibility is to investigate, mediate, and in some cases where um, allegations of police misconduct are um, more on a serious level, then we have the ability to administratively prosecute claims of misconduct. Um, the agency is entirely staffed of civilians, including primarily investigators and attorneys. <clears throat> the CCRB is governed by a board. Uh, the board has 15 members. Those 15 members are selected by the four um, sections that you see um, four sections of government that you see on the um, screen. So the mayor can appoint five appointees to the board. The five appointees that are selected um, don't have any specific residency requirements um, besides living within the five boroughs. So this is where the mayor may see, you know, education, <clears throat> um, experience, um, uh, cultural different, um, cultural diversity to the board just to make sure that it reflects the diversity in the city of New York. The city council can appoint five appointees to the board. Those five appointees um, have um, residency restrictions. Each one of them must reside in a different borough. The police commissioner has three designees that they place on the board. These three designees are the only people that are allowed to have law enforcement experience throughout the entire board based off of the charter. So um, that adds the, in addition to the other um, experience, this adds practical experience to the conversation about police accountability. Uh, the public advocate ha can appoint one appointee to the board. Um, that one appointee, because it's the singular appointee, must only reside within the five boroughs. Um, and let me just go back for a second. The three appointees have law enforcement experience. However, they cannot currently be active police officers. So this is where the police commissioner may appoint retired police officers. Because they're retired, they're still considered civilians. And then you have the chairperson. The chairperson is jointly appointed by the New York City mayor and the New York City Council. So uh, this, the New York City Police Department has four, fun, four main functions that kind of expand into tons of responsibilities, but those main core functions are maintain order, serve or protect, render aid, and enforce the law. So officers present should be able to keep a neighborhood safe. If an officer sees that an individual is in, in, in distress or in harm, in harm's way, it should intervene to protect and serve that um, individual. If a direct request is asked of the New York City police officer or the New York City Police Department, when that, re when that request is met by services, it's considered rendering aid and um, enforcing the law means that if an individual is uh, accused of committing a crime or they are the officer witnesses them committing a crime, they have the ability to issue a ticket, uh, execute an arrest, so forth and so on. <clears throat> now with these uh, rules and responsibilities, the police department does have strict rules and regulations that they're required to follow. Those rules and regulations are laid out in the New York City Patrol Guide. Um, and the reason why I mention this is because that's also how the police department, that's also how the CCRB determines what's considered misconduct. So when we review cases, we're reviewing allegations of misconduct, and then we're weighing the officer's conduct following an investigation against the actions that are laid out in the police patrol guide. So if an officer acts outside of the patrol guide and the law, then they're likely to be engaged in misconduct. CCRB has four categories of jurisdiction that we can investigate. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna reiterate. Um, the CCRB can intake any complaint about police misconduct. However, we cannot investigate every complaint of police misconduct. The categories that we are allowed to investigate um, are force, abuse of authority, discourtesy, and offensive language. Um, if the allegations fall within these categories, they can be investigated by agency. Just to briefly lay out what those are, um, if force is used during an encounter with a police officer, then it can be investigated by the CCRB. If that force is deemed excessive and or unnecessary, that's when that force becomes, that's when that force is considered misconduct. Uh, these rules are laid out in the patrol guide regarding the amount of force that officers should be using, when they should be using pepper spray, so forth and so on. Um, force could look like an officer punching, kicking, slapping someone, um, grabbing someone, use of an impact weapon, such as a knife stick, um, use of pepper spray and or a taser, um, use of a firearm, um, we expand on the conversation about use of a firearm for, for those that may not know. Regarding use of a firearm, a police officer can discharge a firearm. 
a police officer could strike someone with a firearm. Those are what people would consider common uses of a firearm. If an officer pulls out a firearm and points it at someone, that's also considered uh, that's also considered a show of force. And if it was excessive and or necessary, um, it could also be deemed as misconduct. So if that happens where an officer uses their firearm, however, they did not discharge it, but did pull it out and point it at someone and they felt uncomfortable by it, they could feel free to file a complaint with the CCRB. In a nutshell for this section, we don't anticipate individuals are actually going to go to the patrol guide and look up every aspect of when officers are allowed to um, use force. Um, so if the force that an officer used made an individual uncomfortable, feel free to file a complaint with the CCRB and it's something that can be investigated by agency. Uh, then we have abusive authority. Abusive authority is pretty much our largest category of complaints. On average, if an officer did something, um, when people describe the, the conduct of an officer on most circumstances, um, one of the allegations out of all of them are likely gonna be abusive authority, just because it's like a wide net of um, different types of complaints that could fall within this category. Uh, this is when an officer uses misleading tactics um, in order to uh, gain, an gain, influences, uh, gain an individual's influence or compliance um, when they've made a request of that person. And that includes stop, question, and frisk of a person, vehicle, um, an individual uh, stop request of a person, whether they be maybe walking or stopping an individual's vehicle without justifiable cause, uh, search of a person's vehicle or residence without sufficient or justifiable cause, improper entry, which would be entry into someone's home or vehicle without justifiable cause. So, you know, the, the gist of this, these first three are the lack of justifiable cause. So um, even though it is allowable for a police officer to engage and stop question and frisk encounters, it is allowable for an officer to uh, search an individual or a vehicle or residence. It is allowable where an officer, if they need to, to enter an individual's property or, um, or vehicle, the presence of justifiable cause could be the difference between it being misconduct and it being proper police procedure. Um, in addition to that, officers' refusal to provide name and badge number could also be deemed as abuse of authority in addition, in addition to threatening to call ICE, which is a federal agency um, which governs immigration and customs enforcement. Um, because that agency is in fact federal and the city of New York is deemed as a sanctuary city, um, officers really shouldn't even be calling into question someone's immigration status. Um, it's likely to also be considered misconduct. Um, forcible removal to the hospital. This is a situation where you may see individuals that may be um, deemed as a threat to themselves or maybe experiencing a mental health crisis. Um, in those spaces, officers, there are certain circumstances where officers can remove um, individuals to the hospital for their own safety or for the safety of the public, but it has to be done in a very specific way. If it's not done correctly, it could be deemed misconduct. Um, the CCRB also is now allowed to investigate sexual misconduct. Um, and this is in two different phases. Uh, the first level of uh, sexual misconduct is more deemed sexual harassment, where it's more verbal, um, engaging in sexual or romantic propositions, um, requesting, you know, an individual's, let's say, phone number um, in order to, you know, avoid arrest or a ticket. And those type of things could be, um, those type of things would be deemed as uh, sexual harassment. Uh, secondarily, um, sexual sexual assault. So when it becomes more, more physical, that's where uh, the CCRB can also investigate sexual assault as it deems of sexual misconduct. Um, and those could be um, fully investigated by the CCRB. Um, then we have bias based and racial bias based policing and racial profiling, where if an individual officer is uh, specifically targeting someone or making decisions based on their policing um, that are specific to an individual's race, religion, sexual orientation, gender identity, uh, place of place, place of national origin, um, disability, then that, that an officer may be engaged in bias-based policing. That also includes housing insecurity. So if an individual may be experiencing homelessness and officers are um, using those type of things to determine um, their policing practices, then that might also be bias-based policing. Uh, discourtesy, uh, officers should be respectful, courteous, and professional when they're engaging members of the public. Um, if officers are not, um, such as speaking, gesturing, and or behaving rudely. Um, officers may be um, engaged in misconduct, and this misconduct is called dis being discourteous or discourtesy. Um, that includes use of foul language, use of profanity, um, discourteous conduct, and or discourteous or um, discourteous gestures or actions. So that might be a gesture that may um, reflect profanity, like giving someone the finger, or it could be a gesture where 
um, it's just dis it's a disrespectful gesture, such as an officer requesting my identification. I provide them with my identification in their hand, and they toss my identification on the ground, opposed to handing it back to me the way that I gave it to them. Under those circumstances, um, it could be deemed as um, as being discourteous. And as we know, those type of actions can escalate a police encounter. So we do request that all officers remain professional, courteous, and um, and and respectful, courteous, and 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 professional while they're engaging with members of the public. And if you feel like they didn't, then feel free to file a complaint. Uh, last but not least, um, for Fado is offensive language. This is use of verbally offensive speech. Um, that speech that may uh, include racial or religious slurs. Um, inappropriately referring to someone's race, ethnicity, nationality, religion, gender, sexual orientation, and or gender identity. Um, that includes misgendering. So if an officer uh, refers to someone outside of the gender that they uh, prefer, um, that is something that can be reported to the CCRB, um, especially after being uh, corrected. So if an officer approaches me and says, excuse me, sir, we have something to talk about. If my response is, I, refer, I prefer to be referred to as ma'am, um, giving the the connotation i preferred i referred to be referred to in the uh, colloquial uh, re reference of a female then um and that officer continues to call me sir uh negating the fact that i just corrected them and notified them of my um proper my my um the way that i prefer to be uh, referred uh, or the way that i the way that i identify then that officer can be accused of misgendering and that could be deemed as offensive language uh, the CCRB also provides information regarding the Right to Know Act. I will come back to the Right to Know Act if we have time. Um, I know this is more a conversation about what uh, the CCRB does. So um, I'll come back to the Right to Know Act. Um, so there's a couple of different ways to file a complaint with the CCRB. Um, one of them was mentioned by, uh, by uh, Commander Castro, um, and that's going to your local police precinct now it does not have to be the precinct where the interaction occurred so if your interaction occurred within the confines of let's say the 76th precinct you could go all the way to the the 51st precinct the 52nd precinct in the bronx and file that complaint if you like officers as previously mentioned are required to accept complaints um, at the precinct level um they could also take that form give it to you to fill it out and then also offer you a self-addressed envelope which is posted free, and you could mail that directly to the CCRB um, in the event you don't feel comfortable leaving at the precinct. Um, additional ways to call, additional ways to contact the CCRB include um, contacting us via the phone using our hotline, 1-800-341-2272. Uh, the last four numbers also spell out CCRB, so it may be a little bit easier for folks to remember. So that's 1-800-341-CCRB. Um, we go call, also call 311, everyone's favorite uh, <laughs> three-digit number. Uh, in addition to that, you can come to the New York to the CCRB's headquarters at 100 Church Street on the 10th floor in Lower Manhattan. Uh, you could go to the CCRB's website at nyc.gov forward slash CCRB complaint. Um, I'll leave the link for the website in the chat. Um, on the CCRB is on social media, so you can also direct message or DM the CCRB on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Typical hashtag is uh, CCRB underscore NYC. You could also send the CCRB a, a letter in the mail um to 100 church street 10th floor new york new york is a code 10007 now pretty much anyone could file a complaint um about police misconduct um that includes individuals that are residents and non-residents um and that would be if an individual came into the city of new york to, to visit for two days and they live in california and they had a negative police encounter or witnessed a negative police encounter, then we would be able to uh, take that complaint um, if they filed it. And we'll find the means to be able to communicate with them to do uh, their in-person, their, um, their interview, which likely would be virtual, um, and to gather information about the claim that was made. So an individual doesn't necessarily need to be a New York City resident to file a complaint. They really just need to witness or experience police misconduct to file a complaint with our agency. Um, in addition to that, the CCRB is not concerned about an individual's uh, immigration status, we won't ask. Um, it typically normally has no bearing on the case, so it's not something that we concern ourselves with. So an individual that um, has concerns regarding immigration status, um, it's not something that the CCRB um, uses as a part of the complaint process. Um, however, the CCRB does have translation services. So we do have um, various investigators that are proficient in various different languages. Um, so if an individual is uh, does not if English is not an individual's proficient language and they would like to be paired up with an investigator that speaks their language, we'll make every effort to do so. Otherwise, from that, we'll also use translation services wherever necessary. 
So the life of a CCRB case, and as the, the commander mentioned, um, it, it can be a long process in the sense of depending on what is being, what the complaint is being made um, about. Um, that complaint can take anywhere from two to three months to 200 to 300 days. So um, that being the case, we do encourage individuals to file your complaints about police misconduct as early as possible. Uh, the statute of limitations on a CCRB complaint between the time it is intaken, investigated and delivered. And if there's misconduct is founded, sent to the New York City Police Department for um, trial is 18 months. So that being the case, if it falls without an 18 month time period under most circumstances, we would not be able to investigate it. So just FYI, please, um, make file those complaints as early as possible so that we can ensure that we don't loop or miss that um, statute of limitations. Nonetheless, uh, the conversation starts with intake. An individual calls the CCRB, explains to us that they have a complaint. Um, there's two things that we're looking for in intake. One, is this complaint about a New York City police officer sworn member of service? So um, you may have individuals that wear a, a badge. You may have individuals that carry a weapon, However, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're sworn members of service of the New York City Police Department. So case in point, school safety. Um, school safety may be trained by the police department. Um, however, they are not New York, they're not trained, they're not sworn members of service. So that being the case, the CCRB would not investigate um, school safety. In addition to that, you may have a uh, state trooper or state police. Those individuals are police officers, they are law enforcement. However, they're not New York City law enforcement, they're state law enforcement. So um, same thing with FBI, same thing with um, ICE. Those individuals carry a gun, carry a badge, or engage in law enforcement, but they're in a different jurisdiction. So if they're not New York City police officers, sworn member of service, police officer, sergeant, lieutenant, um, deputy inspector, chief, like um, under those circumstances, we would not be able to investigate them. They have to be sworn members of service to the New York City Police Department. Um, we also do not investigate police officers that are not within the five boroughs. So that being the case, if they're like Nassau County, Yonkers, that, those are also officers we would not be able to investigate. Um, so once we verify that the officer is a New York City uh, police officer, sworn member of service, then we have to verify, is the complaint fatal? Does the complaint fall under force, abuse of authority, discourtesy, and or offensive language? If it does not, then we would not be able to investigate the claim. However, we can make referrals to agencies that can. Under most circumstances, a lot of these referrals may go to the um, New York City Police Department's chief of department, or they may go to the Internal Affairs Bureau, as previously mentioned. Um, nonetheless, if they do not fall within our categories of jurisdiction, based off of the charter, we are not allowed to investigate those claims. But we can we can forward them. Um, to give you a, a, a one specific example, we got a complaint some time ago about park enforcement. Park enforcement is not New, they're not New York City police officers, sworn member of service. Um, they really answer to the uh, New York City um, Parks Department. So even though they have a jurisdiction, um, they are allowed to engage in law enforcement. There, we had to forward that case over to um, the the park the Parks Department for it to be investigated. Um, next, so it has to be fatal has to be a sworn member of service. Let's say both check boxes are checked. Um, then we can conduct an event. We, we have the, investig the, the matter is forwarded over to an investigator. The investigator can make a decision. Um, they have two choices under most circumstances. Can this case be mediated or does it need to be investigated? If the allegations in the case, and I'm gonna show you the difference between allegations, um, a complaint is the full story, everything that happened. The allegations is are uh, it would be when that full story is now broken down into things that the agency can investigate. So if you ever look at the CCRB's complaint activity map, you may see that a precinct may have received 20 complaints, but may have 45 allegations that were investigated. And that's because one complaint can include more than one allegation. Each allegation is investigated independently. So let's say for the sake of argument, an allegation within a complaint includes force or sexual misconduct. The CCRB would not allow that type of case to be mediated. However, if move from under most other circumstances, most cases do qualify for mediation. So mediation is pretty much a sit down conversation between the individual that filed the complaint and the officer to discuss the, the facts of the, the, to discuss what happened during the encounter. During these encounters, officers may offer an apology. They may just explain why the situation may have taken place or why the confrontation may have taken place. And if it got out of control, why it may have gotten out of control. Um, this is mainly a meeting of the minds between two parties. It's confidential, completely voluntary. And if the uh, person that filed the complaint is satisfied, 
then the complaint pretty much goes away for the officer. Um, it does not appear on that police officer's personnel record because we would no longer have to investigate that claim if the person that filed the complaint is happy with the mediation process. Um, however, um, if the person is not happy with the mediation process, everything goes back on the table because it now must be investigated. Um, these mediations are conducted in the presence of a neutral mediator. So that mediator does not work for the CCRB. They do not work for the New York City Police Department. Um, so this is, we just contract out for those um, mediations, for those mediation services. Um, and the person that determines if the, if the mediation was successful or not is the person that filed the complaint. So that being the case, it's really up to the officer to convince that person that this mediation was successful. Um, the individual does not need a good or justifiable reason to um to say that they didn't like or didn't the mediation wasn't successful it's completely up to their feeling if they feel as though the mediation wasn't um satisfactory to them then we won't question that we'll just go forward with an investigation so an investigation let's say for the sake of argument individuals go through mediation it did not work out um now we have to go to an investigation our investigation are pretty much like anyone else's investigations um we are looking for evidence right we're trying to find out the truth of a matter so that being the case um we are um interviewing the police officer the officers are required to participate in the ccrb's process by offering a sworn statement to the ccrb if during the course of that sworn statement we we verify or can prove that the officer is uh not giving us a truthful statement then we can make allegate we can um, make recommendations for discipline for that officer if we could verify that the officer gave us an untruthful statement um but nonetheless they must give us a truthful they must give us a, a sworn statement regarding the encounter in addition to that, um, any other officers that may have been there, we could also request that they provide us with a statement as well. Um, the CCRB has subpoena power, so we could use that subpoena power to get additional information that we need to investigate claims. Um, officers can also provide us with the, the New York City Police Department also provides us with body worn camera footage from um, encounters that are compl where complaints where that lead to complaints to the CCRB. We could also use video footage from an individual that may have just been a bystander. Um, we could request municipal bottom municipal camera footage, stationary cameras such as like a ring camera or security camera from a store or commercial pro or commercial business. Um, nonetheless, we could also request memo log books 911 um, 911 um 911 calls um and memo and um other nypd documents to get to the truth of the matter uh the ccrb does not hate or dislike officers our responsibility is to conduct a non-biased and impartial investigation so we're looking for the truth and wherever that truth leads us we'll make our determination regarding what the outcome is based on evidence um for allegations that are made um once those allegations are investigated the findings of the investigator now are forwarded to our to our, our board the board is broken down into a three-member panel um those three-member panels are mixed up between the mayor's appointees the nypd's appointees the public advocates appointees and the um the new york city council's appointees and they make a decision um do i accept the recommendation of the investigator or do i make another um make another um assessment um did the officer engage in activity and was it misconduct um, not every situation where the officer engaged in the activity that they're being accused of is it always considered misconduct. So um, the four outcomes could be one substantiation, which means that the officer engaged in the activity they're being accused of and it was misconduct. Second is un unable to determine, which means we don't have enough evidence to verify either way if it was or wasn't misconduct because we didn't reach what's called the preponderance of the evidence. Um, three is unfounded, which means that the altercation may have not taken place the way that it was described to us or maybe didn't happen at all um so clearly misconduct did not occur or um within department of guidelines means the altercation happened it even it could have even happened exactly the way the person described it however the actions taken by the officer were not deemed as misconduct because it fell within department of guidelines so um just because an officer is accused of doing something and may have done that thing that they're accused of doesn't necessarily mean that it was always considered or was always will be determined as misconduct. So the CCRB's board has to make those determinations. Did it happen? Was it misconduct? And if it was misconduct, then we have to then the board has to determine what the recommendations for discipline are. Um, that discipline is uh, a range of discipline that that mainly deal with that officer standing within the New York City Police Department. Um, I'll go into that uh, shortly. During the course of an investigation, if an individual determines or uh, the relays to us that they need additional assistance, such as, you know, the inter inter the interaction with the police officer was, um, 
you know, traumatizing. They may need uh, mental health services. Um, the CCRB's civilian assistance unit, which are staffed with licensed social workers and victims advocates, can ref can make citywide referrals for such services. So they may have, you know, food insecurities, housing insecurities. They may need additional legal services. The CCRB could provide or point individuals in the right direction because we realize two things. One, the individual has may have other things concerning them besides this complaint. Um, there may be residual issues because of this encounter. And in addition to that, um, <clears throat> the person, the individual that making the complaint is a whole person, right? So um, they will be with us, likely be with us for a long time. So things may come up while that's happening. And we want to make sure that that person is still okay. Because um, some of these things may also impede them from continuing to participate in our process. So um, the CCRB does provide those referral services for individuals that uh, give the notion that they need it. Um, additionally, the C so when it comes to uh, the CCRB's final determination, if that final determination is considered um, what's called uh, charges and specifications, which are cases where the overall determination for discipline is upwards of 11 or more vacation days being removed between that range up to termination from the police department, they must go through an administrative trial. Um, that administrative trial is held at one police plaza at NYPD headquarters. It's presided over by the New York City Police Department's commissioner or deputy commissioner of trials. And they mainly deal with that police officer standing within the New York City Police Department. Um, so the range of discipline could go anywhere from officers being given instruction by the commanding officer, um, officers being sent back to the police academy for additional training. Um, that's considered formalized training. Um, forfeiting of vacation days or what's considered penalty days. Anywhere from one to five, it's considered command discipline A. Six to 10, is command discipline B. And as I mentioned, anything above that will be considered charges and specifications. On the final determination of officers being disciplined, it still does lie within the New York City Police Department with the uh, police commissioner being the final say so regarding if, if officers are disciplined and what that discipline is. On one of our more popular cases um, is the case of Daniel Pantaleo, the detective, uh, the former detective that put Eric Gardner in a fatal chokehold. Um, the CCRB determined that the officer could not, in good conscience, stay within the New York City Police Department as a detective. The police department agreed with us. Um, the commissioner ultimately made a decision to fire, um, remove Daniel Pantaleo from the police department. <clears throat> so um, this is my, this is two more sections to go, I promise. Um, the policy department, um, as an individual files a complaint with the CCRB, that information is um, held onto is put into a database, and that database is used on an annual, on a monthly, annual, or semi annual basis to provide information back to the public. So these are through um, statistical reports. A monthly statistical report would notify you of what took place within the CCRB for the month prior. So let's say our APU did 15 cases that resulted in these specific outcomes. That information may be there. Let's say we received 100 additional cases within that month. That information is likely to be there. But nonetheless, it gives you a monthly breakdown of what's happening within the CCRB pertaining to cases. Then we have a, a semi-annual report, which breaks that same information down, but over a six-month time period. And then the same thing happens in an annual report over a 12-month time period. This is just the CCRB giving that information back to the public. However, the public policymakers, elected officials choose to use that information is purely up to uh, those bodies and those individuals. Um, we also do issue-based reports. Um, some of our more popular issue-based reports are police, youth and police, um, where, we, uh, where we studied over a certain period of time, the interactions between youth and police officers where a complaint was filed with the CCRB. Um, in addition to um, how police officers were using body, how police officers were using body worn camera footage um, and how that was either helping or impeding the CCRB's investigation process and how police officers were using um, tasers based off of complaints that were received by the CCRB between 2014 and 2017. The CCRB also has a Youth Advisory Council. This Youth Advisory Council is a group of 10 young people that um, pretty, pretty much guide the CCRB regarding best ways that the, and what, that the CCRB can relate to young people so that they understand the mission and goals of the CCRB, but also how the police department can engage young people so that we have less negative encounters between police officers and youth. Um, they operate for a year basis. Um, so we typically start recruitment for Youth Advisory Council roughly in November. 
we select them in January and then they serve for that full for that full year. Um, those that want to serve on the, the, the CCRB's Youth Advisory Council must be between must be New Yorkers between the ages of 10 and 18. Um, some of the more common things that the Youth Advisory Council has done is our Youth Speak Up, Speak Out, Youth Speak Up, Speak Out um, uh, Youth Summit that happens on an annual basis. And we also have a, a PSA public service announcement that was filmed by our 2019 by a 2020 cohort of the CCRB's Youth Advisory Council, which featured uh, the daughter of the late Eric Gardner. Last but not least, outreach. Um, our responsibility from outreach is to provide information to the public so individuals know what the CCRB does, how it does, it's how it um, fulfills its function, and they can have some trust that the function is going to be a function that, um, that, the, that the activity of the CCRB is going to be something that's credible. So um, we provide information regarding, like in this meeting, structure of the agency, civilian rights, information about police encounters. We heavily stress de-escalation, um, how to file complaints, what the investigation and mediation process look like. Um, the CCRB does outreach in various fashions. Um, this fashion would be uh, conducive of what's considered as um, conventional outreach, which includes us doing a full length or short presentation that includes um, the, the components that I previously mentioned. We do these with educational institutions, after school programs, places of worship, LGBT, LGBTQIA um, plus uh, service program providers, those that are experiencing homelessness, um, the service providers for those programs. Um, we do staff presentations for elected officials offices and immigration services. We also do what's considered unconventional um, outreach, which would be like doing presentations in barbershops and salons, um, going to local recreational centers, basketball courts, tennis courts, football fields, baseball diamonds, and um, providing information about the Right Snow Act and how to file complaints about police misconduct, block by block, which is walking neighborhoods and canvassing neighborhoods with credible messengers and local nonprofit organizations to provide this information to the public. Um, just to go back, CCRB courtside must also be done with credible messengers and or community organizations. We need validators in order to verify, in order to um, get garner um, the interest of members of the public regarding understanding what this information is and really taking interest in it. Um, lastly, for unconventional is um, CCRB Cares. We would volunteer with organizations, nonprofit organizations, while while providing information about um, how to file complaints about police misconduct and understanding the right to no act. Um, we also participate in things like National Night Out Against Crime, Community Family Days, um, block parties, uh, civic association, community events, health fairs, community board meetings such as this one, and um, precinct council meetings. Uh, this is just a few images of us out and about in the community. Um, that is me on the bottom shooting that basket. It did go in. That was in Brownsville. Uh, that shot was epic. Um, I, I was actually doing pretty good that day. Um, above is one of our CCRB court, uh, one of our CCRB barbershops that took place in Staten Island. Um, that's the end of my presentation. Unless we have more time to go into the Right to Know Act, I'll answer any questions that anyone has. Why don't we see if anyone has any questions? That was very comprehensive, and thank you uh, for all that information. And I just want to make it clear that these complaints were not, like um, Jahai said, we're not encouraging people or saying this is something that you do every day. But if there is an issue, you do have a venue to do this. This also helps Deputy Inspector Castro know about any complaints and practices within the precinct. He is one person, and while I see him everywhere, he obviously can't be everywhere at the same time. So if there's any issues or concerns, he has been very open in letting us know that he's there to listen and to support that. So it also helps him to know what is going on in his precinct, uh, because he, like he said earlier before, the community is really helpful in letting him know things that are going on. And it also helps us with accountability and policing. That's really important. So thank you, Jahai, for that presentation. We're gonna ask a couple of questions and I think the right to know is really important because people may not be aware of that. So we're gonna take a pause so I see at least two hands up and then we could go back to that. Not a problem. Uh, I don't know. Would you like me to call them? Uh, yes, because I don't know who was first. Okay, I have uh, Gabino Morales first. Hi, good afternoon, Mr. Jahai. Um, thank you for that comprehensive um, information session you gave us, uh, presentation. It's very helpful for our community members to know um, the necessary steps to take in order to 
make sure we have accountability here in our community. And um, it's very outstanding, your work um, and how you explain all the processes. Uh, we appreciate that very much. I appreciate that very much. Um, I do have a question uh, about mm -hmm. regarding um, the dispositions on the files on the complaint on an officer. Mm -hmm. uh, would you guys happen to have each officer's names and what complaints they have on them on file for the public? Or is that something we have to request like uh, with the Freedom of Information Act? Or uh, is that something because I, you know, when people write a complaint at a precinct, like what happens to that complaint form? Does it go to the precinct and you guys have a separate um, uh, kind of a file or is that this one in the same um, thing? Okay. So um, to answer your first question, <clears throat> the reports may not, if the reports were done prior to 2020, um, they may not have information regarding the police officer specifically because of 50A, uh, the law that shielded police officers uh, discipline records. So prior to 2020, um, we weren't allowed to really provide that information to members of the public. Um, I believe it was late 2019 or early 2020 where the state Senate and state assembly repealed it. Um, so now we have the ability to provide that information regarding um, the police officers. However, our website, and I'll put a link in the chat, does have information on um, what's called the member of service re records. Um, and in that you can just look up an officer's discipline records where it pertains to cases that came directly from the CCRB. Um, we only have those cases, the P NYPD, I believe, and um, uh, Deputy Inspector Castro could correct me if I'm wrong. NYPD also has a uh, records database where you can look up information regarding a police officer's discipline record. Um, I'm not certain under which, like where the cases may have come from, but um, if they include CCRB cases or it's just cases that went directly to the NYPD, but I believe they also have a, a database if, if I'm not mistaken. So um, even if you don't want to look up the records on the, on the report, you may be able to just, if you're curious about a specific officer or officers within a specific precinct, use that database and pull up officers um, it has to be cases that happened before 20, before 2000, before year 2000. Um, and if the case was mediated, as I mentioned, that information won't come up because it wouldn't have been investigated. Um, it shows what the outcome of the case was, what the CCRB's determination for discipline was, and if, um, and what the NYPD's final determination was. Um, regarding the complaint process in the precinct. So if the NYPD receives a complaint, um, and you leave it with the NYPD, they would typically mail that or forward that information over to the CCRB. And then we would generate a CCRB complaint number from it. And then we would use the information that was relayed in that complaint to have an interaction with the person that filed the complaint and then created a brand new complaint from there. So um, the only difference between the two is that we're generating a CCRB complaint number from that. And we're kind of taking it from there if it falls within our jurisdiction. If it does not fall within our jurisdiction, then we wouldn't be the ones to investigate it. I appreciate that information. Thank you. Thank you, Jahi. You're welcome. I have Cynthia Gonzalez next. Cynthia, you're muted. I'm, I was trying to unmute myself. I had trouble with it. I'm sorry for that. First of all, I want to thank Cynthia for bringing this outstanding presentation and Mr. Rose for delivering it because it was quite outstanding. Um, and, and I want to thank you both for that because I feel that almost every question was answered in that presentation. So I just want to have, I just want to ask one question. Um, what is the percentage of reports by underage youth to the CCRB? That I would have to get back to you on um, because our annual report for 2021 hasn't come out yet. So I'd only really be able to look back at complaints that came in from 2020, which, which was a while ago. So um, I'd have to get back to you regarding that. I have to pull that, um, pull that information and I'll get it straight over to you. Thank uh, you could, so um, much. Thank you so, so much for being here tonight. Thank you. Not a problem. So my email and my um, phone number are in the chat. So if you could feel free to either email me or text me the very specific request, um, I could forward that over to our policy unit and we can have that information forwarded. 
Cynthia, I took note of the question and I'll follow up with Jahai for that. Thank you, Cynthia, for everything you did tonight. <laughs> oh, not a problem. And I think the last piece is important because it's called the right to know. And that's kind of relatively new, if I recall. And uh, that really gives some information on what is it that you could ask the police officer to provide you. So Jahad, do you want to just go back and briefly do that? And then we'll uh, end the meeting. And thank you, Cynthia. Okay, absolutely. And for me for one moment, I'm just going to share my screen again. I believe you still can. We can see it. Perfect. Uh... Okay, so the Right to Know Act is a law that went into effect in 2018. Um, the, the problem with the law going into effect in 2018 is that it wasn't amazingly promoted to members of the public. So this is still kind of new to a, a lot of people. So the Right to Know Act is a law that impacts police encounters. Um, with those police encounters, it pretty much changes how police officers can engage with members of the public. Um, by adding an extra layer of pretty much conversation. So if a police officer stops someone, um, the police officer should be providing and identifying information such as name, badge number, rank, command, um, and shield number. Um, in addition to that, police officers should be explaining the purpose of the encounter with some exceptions. So let's say for the sake of argument, an encounter is going way left. Um, it's uh, hostile, violent, um, police officers should just engage, right? They need to reduce the level of harm um, to protect themselves. They shouldn't be stopping and say, hey, I'm stopping this, uh, this fist fight or this brawl out, um, or I'm trying to re remove a gun from you. Nonetheless, if it's a more calm situation, then police officers should be ex explaining the purpose of the encounter. Um, I'm going to skip number three and go straight to number four. Um, police officers should also be offering business cards. Uh, those business cards has um, information that explains who that officer is with that same identifying information, name, rank, command, precinct, shield number. And um, it also, on the flip side of that card, shows you how to file a comment and or complaint about the interaction between you and that officer. So if that encounter was great and the officer did everything you wanted them to do, you understand why officers are in your neighborhood, feel free, make that, comp make that um, comment. It'll go to the local police precinct and they may use that to, um, you know, make accommodation for a, 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 a officer. If you believe this officer did everything wrong, violated every right that you have, then you can feel free to make a complaint. If that complaint falls within the jurisdiction of the CCRB, that will get sent straight to the CCRB for investigation. Um, the card also has how you could obtain body worn camera footage from an interaction with you and that officer. Um, in that case, that body worn camera footage doesn't necessarily need to be because an individual is filing a complaint. It could just be because you want to get clarity, right? And the person that is starring in that body worn camera footage is you, right? You're the person that's facing the body worn camera footage. So you may be entitled to it. So that being the case, uh, you can feel free to um, make to, to use that card to obtain that information. Also on the flip side of the card, it has how you can make anonymous tips to the New York City Police Department through the Crime Stoppers hotline and additional information such as the counterterrorism hotline, where you could also provide tips to the NYPD regarding um, any suspected terrorism in your neighborhood. Um, so the circumstances where the first three things that I mentioned are typically invoked would be in level two and level three encounters. Level two encounters are more accusatory questions um, where a police officer may be investigating or verifying um, information relating to a crime. So if an officer may be asking a question that may make you feel like you're being accused, like a crime happened up the block around the corner, were you there? Did you have something to do with it? Did you witness it? Um, did you take part? Did you orchestrate it? Those, may, those questions may fall under a level two encounter. Um, level three encounters are a lot more direct. You're the person the officer is looking for. Um, you're the one being accused. They may have someone that fits your description um, and they're interacting with you because they believe that you may have engaged in a crime. Um, if it's a level three um, where you're being directly accused, then business cards should be offered. The, the police officer should be explaining the purpose of the encounter. Um, like I said, with, with some exceptions. Now, that is the part of the right to know act regarding what you have the right to know, right? So think of the right to know act as a play on words. It's what you have the right to know or what you have the right to be made aware of and what you have the right to say no to or what you have the right to refuse. So second half of the right to know act pertains to uh, a search. So as we all know, there's a difference between a search and a frisk. A frisk is a pat down of the outer layer of an individual's clothing. Um, 
or let's say you're being stopped in a vehicle. Sometimes the officer may peruse the back of the vehicle with an open light or may look into the back of a vehicle. Anything in open sight would be um, equivalent to like a frisk of an individual. That being the case, um, that's not impacted by the right to know act, but it, it, it lends to the conversation about reasonable suspicion, probable cause, or what's what we consider justifiable cause. Now, <clears throat> if an officer goes through a search, there's two types of search that the officer could go through. There's various, but two types for this, for this conversation. A search that does not require consent means that the officer has justifiable cause. There's a reason. Let's say they did the pat down. They felt something that felt like a weapon, a knife, a gun, a, a metal pipe, a blunt object. That individual may then, con that officer may then conduct the search. Let's say they're perusing the back of the vehicle. They see what appears to be a gun in the back seat or what compares to be a, a white powdery substance that may, rep that may look like uh, some type of illegal narcotic. That officer may have justified, that may give the officer justifiable cause to search that vehicle by entering the vehicle. <clears throat> Under those circumstances, officers do not require consent. They could just go forward with the search. However, if the officer does not have justifiable cause, they may just be going off of a hunch. I believe that this may be present, even though I don't have any evidence. That officer is then required to notify that person that they have to ask for their permission. Um, and with that permission, the individual has the right to say no. Um, sometimes when an individual hears a police officer request permission to do something, they may hear that request for that permission as a command opposed to as a request, solely because of the gun and the badge and the authority. So is the officer's responsibility to clarify that. So if an officer has to request an individual's consent to do a search, that officer must also include notifying that person of their right to say no. So this may sound something like this. Excuse me, I'd like to conduct a search of your person. Um, I require your consent to do so. You have the right to say no. That conversation should not be uh, sound like you have the right to say no and their consequences. So if you say no, I'm going to arrest you and search you anyway. If you say no, I'm going to put you inside the back of my car and search you eventually. Um, I'm going to arrest you if you say no. That shouldn't be the case. It should be the officer realizing they don't have justifiable cause and realizing that if I don't get this person's consent to search, I will then be violating their Fourth Amendment right, which is their right to not be subjected to unreasonable search and seizure, which is search and seizure without justifiable cause. So that being the case, it's the officer's responsibility to notify them that one, I must get your consent Two, you have the right to say no. Um, <clears throat> as a part of this, the police officer is also responsible for providing language access services. If the individual communicating with the officer does not understand the language that the officer is speaking, none of this means anything, right? If I don't understand what you're saying, then how am I gonna comply or reasonably um, execute my rights? That being the case, the officer is then required to provide language access services, which could look like an officer using their phone, like we all have these city agency cell phones that um, they could use to contact a language line that could interpret between the officer and the person that they're inter and having the encounter with, and or getting an officer that speaks the language of the person that they're having the engagement with um, that, or that encounter with, and that officer may be able to interpret between the two parties. Either way, it is the officer's responsibility to um, notify, to, to get language access services to ensure that both parties are speaking in the same language. Um, if an officer does not follow any component of the Right to Know Act um, and you notify the CCRB, it can be investigated. And if it determined that the officer did not follow the Right to Know Act appropriately, then we can make recommendations for discipline. Thank you for informing us about that. Um, and thank you for joining us here tonight. Like Cynthia Gonzalez mentioned earlier, it was very informative. Would we be able to get a copy of the presentation to share with um, community members that were not here today? Because we do send out a report. So I believe I could provide a truncated version of the presentation, but not the whole presentation like the one that I have here. That'd be great. A truncated, uh, abbreviated version would be perfect. And okay. also we are live on YouTube now, so it will be in uh, available to everyone to do this. Do you do this presentation in other languages? Yes, we can. So um, if we are notified with enough lead time, then we can have inter interpreters accompany us to do the presentations in various languages. So we just need it's just a matter of the lead time more than the matter of the, of the possibility of it. Oh, that's great to know. Thank you so much. Are there any other questions from anybody, any board members, any of um, the community members on the call? No? I see no additional hands up, Cynthia. Great. 
So with that, I would like to once again thank Deputy Inspector Castro for joining us and giving us uh, uh, the plan for safety in the community. We want to thank him and the 72nd Precinct, as well as Tina for joining us and giving us information on the upcoming Build the Block and the community council meeting. And thank you to Jahai Rose from the Civilian Complaint Review Board for uh, learning us about the process and giving such a comprehensive uh, presentation on what it is that is um, complainable and what it is that we could do if we do have any concerns or issues. Um, thank you all for joining us and staying with us for the course of this. Thank you, Jeremy, as always, for helping us facilitate. And I want to wish everyone a great night and a special thank you to the committee members for joining today. Appreciate you all. Have a great night. Have a good night. Bye-bye. Okay.